Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning. I come from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just down the road there, down 22. Yeah. <laughs> Having stegians all day. <laughs> it's still Stiller's country. <laughs> Uh, really, really happy to be here. Uh, have some roots here. Uh, well, I should say, you know, family members have roots. This is my brother. Um, <laughs> proud Penn State alum. Uh, uh, and I've always been really impressed by this university and its uh, ability to whip people up into a frenzy uh, <laughs> over its school pride. Uh, my brother actually used to smuggle a cowbell to the games in his pants. Uh, to come to the football games. <laughs> um, so yeah. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here. So anyways, remember books? Anybody remember these? Some big heavy things made of dead trees, right? Uh, a bunch of different pages, right? Consists of these things called pages. Cut your fingers as you turn the page. It's an awful thing. So I'm glad these books aren't around anymore. Uh, <laughs> but, but this notion of the page has actually been with us for, for the last couple millennia. And that's really bled into how we think of the web, right? Web pages. Oh, we're a university website, and we have tens of thousands of pages. Oh, my God, what do we do, right? Brad, how long is the home page going to take to build? Sort of depends on what's on it, right? Um, so, so this notion of, of how we talk about the web as a series of web pages is very much influenced how we approach our work, right? How we design and develop web experiences. But now this is our reality, right? We have all these different devices that are accessing the web. So what do we do? Oh, well, we, now we need to show what our web page is going to look like on a laptop and on an iPad, and on an iPhone, and that laptop is always a MacBook Pro or a MacBook Air, right? <laughs> Maybe an iMac if people are feeling saucy or whatever, right? And we, and, and we tilt these things slightly to ooh, get that, that wow factor to, to our, our clients and stakeholders, right? This is, this is nothing more than a, a, a tremendous waste of a talented designer's time. Uh, so we have to Blow, blow this up, right? We have to blow up this notion of, of thinking of, of the web as these series of pages. And we quite literally have to blow up our, our web pages, right? Our interfaces themselves, right? And I've been asking myself this question for a while now, right? What are our interfaces made of? What are the web's Lego bricks? What are the web's sort of subway sandwich pieces that we arrange into millions of delicious combinations, right? I've been thinking about this for a while. Uh, uh, as Jenna mentioned, uh, I run a site called This Is Responsive, which is a, a collection of responsive design patterns, right? But this notion of that we're designing these, these systems of components rather than the series of pages is becoming ever more important. Anybody use Foundation here? No Foundation by Zurb? Okay, so this is like a little sort of component library. What about Bootstrap? Who's using Bootstrap in here? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. I'm not judging you. Maybe I am, right? And I like these things. I, I, I think that these things are great, right? It's, it's it, what these things are, these UI sort of toolkits, right? These front-end toolkits that, that give us those Lego bricks that we're able to rearrange into uh, all these different combinations, whatever we need it. To, to do. And so, so conceptually, I'm totally on board with this, right? The system of components is what these things are. This is my issue with these things, though. Uh, <laughs> when I heard watch sci-fi movies as a kid, I like, couldn't shake the thought out of my head, where I'm like, I guess if, if just given enough time, we, we just solve fashion. <laughs> we just, so, some guy's like, hey, how, how about we just wear jumpsuits from now on? And everybody's like, sure. <laughs> Tim Gunn would be proud, right? Look at these happy people. But, you know, like, this, is, this isn't how 
human beings work, right? We all have different goals, we all have different desires, we all have different uh, objectives and stuff. So, you know, sort of these, these frameworks, right, while they are these great sort of systems, they are one solution of many. And because you have a lot of the, the internet using these one solution, <laughs> or the, the, you know, the, the, especially Bootstrap, it's the most watched repository on GitHub, extremely popular, you end up with a bunch of lookalike issues, right? If Nike, Adidas, Puma, Reebok were to all redesign their sites using Bootstrap, right, they would look substantially similar. That's sort of not what they're going for, right? These frameworks give you a lot. In fact, they might give you too much, right, that you might not end up using, but your end users have to download all that extra stuff. On the flip side of that coin, they might not go far enough, they might not give you everything you need, right? And you have to subscribe to how someone else has structured and named their stuff, right? But again, conceptually, these things are great, right? These systems of components. Uh, Dave Rupert, uh, designer and developer down in Austin, Texas, uh, they did a, a redesign of Microsoft.com. And he wrote an article about what they delivered to Microsoft for their project. And he really sort of summed it up in this really nice, succinct way, right? That we need tiny bootstraps for every client, right? For every organization. He says, responsive deliverables should look a lot like fully functioning Twitter bootstrap style systems that are custom tailored for your client's needs, right? Or your organization's needs, right? So it's not just about using bootstrap, it's about taking the time to craft your own unique design system. That's what's given rise to a lot of these pattern libraries, front-end style guides, that, uh, as Anna Debenham calls them, wrote a fantastic book. The benefits of these things are many, right? One, we're promoting consistency and cohesion across the entire user experience, right? We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. It makes things easier to test, establishes a better workflow between you and all the other people working on your website, creates a shared vocabulary for everyone in an organization. It's a useful reference to keep coming back to. And more importantly, I'd say it serves as this foundation that you can live with and grow with and modify and extend over time. So these things are great, and there's a bunch of different tools out there uh, to sort of help make this stuff happen, right? This one's uh, called Style Guide Boilerplate by Brett Jankard. Uh, this one's called Bare Bones by uh, Paul Robert Lloyd over in the UK. Whenever you crack these things open, you see, okay, here's what your headings look like. Here's what your paragraphs look like. Here's what your small text looks like. Here's what a horizontal link list looks like. Here's what a vertical link looks like. Right? Here's what our form fields look like. Here's what our labels look like. Here's what notes about those fields look like. Right? And so increasingly, we've been seeing a bunch of these things released out into the wild. Uh, Code for Americas is absolutely fantastic. Uh, uh, Salesforce One is beautiful. Uh, MailChimp is on their third or fourth iteration of their own pattern library. Uh, Yelp uh, released their style guide, uh, made a reference to Atomic Design. Pretty happy about that, yeah. Pretty cool, but it really all started with, uh, with Starbucks. Uh, so Starbucks went responsive about three years ago, and whenever they released their new site, they released alongside it this style guide, right? And whenever you could crack open the hood on these things, it's like, okay, we have these patterns, and we're calling this one blocks three up, right? And this is just a basic interface pattern that they're going to be using throughout their experience. And you're able to resize the browser and sort of see how this all works, and it's going to react across different screen sizes and so on and so forth. Here's one that's called a featured list with a little thumbnail, little headline, little excerpt. Um, you know, pretty common pattern. They're going to be using it a bunch of different places. Here's their data tables, right? Here's a, a relatively simple data table that will squish quite nicely onto small screens. But then here's an example of a more complex table, and how's that going to work on smaller screens? Right? I love these. I think that absolutely this is how we need to be approaching our design and development projects in 2015 and beyond. Uh, we created, uh, Anna Devon and I have created a, a resource for these style guides, for these pattern libraries called styleguides.io, um, which includes the podcasts and resources and tools and examples and all that good stuff. So, so these things are fantastic. 
I love them. But they take a lot of time to make, right? I don't know about you, but I don't go into work every morning and I'm like, hmm, wonder what I'm going to do today. You know, maybe I'll make a style. Okay. It's like, you know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're all under the gun to get stuff out the door, to ship things and iterate on things and, you know, get, make stuff happen. And because these things are often treated as this sort of auxiliary project, as this sort of separate thing, it tends to sort of slip between the cracks or become de deprioritized over time, right? These pattern libraries are great, but oftentimes they're too abstract, right? How, do, how does blocks three up get used, right? Where, where is this being employed? Very often they're only seen as a designer or developer tool, right? Sort of a, a best kept secret from the rest of the organization. Oftentimes they're only created after the fact, right? If project launches and then you sort of go back through and cherry pick patterns after the fact. Very often they only serve present use cases, right? Maybe your organization doesn't do a lot of video work right now, but wouldn't it be great to already have a pattern in place in case that video stuff becomes a priority down the road? Then the last thing, and this is the thing I really latched onto, was that I, as much as I love these things and I'm, and I'm happy to see more and more of these things released out into the wild, I, I felt like for a lot of them, they're just sort of a spray of modules, where it's just this, sort of this loosely organized, or maybe not even organized at all, sort of spray of, of modules. And so I was like, well, you know, maybe there's, there's a, a way to be a little more deliberate, a little more constructive with that. So that's what led me to create what I'm now calling atomic design. Let this slide sink in for you. <laughs> sort of a weird slide. <laughs> but my, my high school chemistry class was taught by this gruff dude uh, who looked a lot like Wilford Brimley. I couldn't find a picture of my actual teacher, so that's Wilford Brimley. Um, but we had to do all of these uh, chemical equations. We had to balance all these chemical equations. As I, as I kept coming back to thinking about interface design, I kept coming back to this high school chemistry class and, and all the stuff that we learned for that. So in the natural world, right, there are atoms, right? Atoms are the basic building blocks of all matter. They can't be broken down any further without losing their meaning, right? They're these sort of abstract items that each have their own unique qualities, right? These atoms combine together to form molecules, right? Like how hydrogen and oxygen combine together to form water molecules. These molecules keep combining together into more complex molecules, which keep combining further into these sort of simple organisms, which combine further to create more complex organisms, like a human being. Uh, I, did, I did a Google image search for, for people, and this dude showed up. I'm like, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> You're going in my slides, <laughs> right? <laughs> Rock and a beret, yeah. But all matter in the known universe, I kept them in there, uh, <laughs> is composed of this same finite set of atomic elements. Right? That was a beautiful concept, I think. And as it turns out, we have this as well. Right? Uh, this guy, Josh Duck, came up with the periodic table of HTML elements. Right, which I think is super clever, right? So it's like, here's your form markup, here's your table markup, here's all of your sort of typography markup and stuff like that. It's super, super clever. But because we're coming at this with the same set of, sort of similar set of finite building blocks, maybe we could apply that same process that happens in the natural world to our interfaces. So that's what atomic design is, is this, this sort of set of these five distinct stages that all happen concurrently. This isn't a linear process, it's more a mental model for how we craft an effective interface design system. So it's comprised of atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages. I'll sort of start with atoms, right? So again, atoms in the, in the real world Right, have their own distinct qualities. They can't be broken down any further without you know, stop, ceasing to be functional. 
Well, what are our, our interfaces, atoms? Well, how about things like labels, inputs, buttons, right? All of these things can't be broken down any further, although they're not terribly useful on their own, right? Clicking a button in space isn't going to do anything, right? So at the molecule level, what we're doing is we're taking those atoms and we're combining them together into these relatively simple components, right? So now all of a sudden, that label atom is useful. It's defining that, that input. All of a sudden, clicking that button submits that form, right? So now you have this nice, simple, encapsulated chunk of interface that you could reuse again and again. So then the, the organism level, what we're doing is we're taking that molecule, that search form molecule, and putting that into context of a header organism, right? And that header organism might be composed of a logo atom, a primary navigation molecule, search form molecule, right? And all of that collectively, you know, forms its own standalone, relatively complex component. Right? We see this on literally any website we go to. Right? And it might be com composed of a bunch of disparate elements like an image and you know, a form and, and uh, uh, unordered lists and stuff like that. Or it might be the same tweet list organism that's composed of the same tweet molecule repeated over and over and over and over again. Right? So what we have with these organisms are these relatively complex components that we're now at this template level able to take these, these, these organisms and put them into their context. Right? Something that resembles a web page. The thing though here is that what we're not, this isn't the final stage of this process. What we're focused on here is that underlying content structure. Uh, Mark Bolton wrote this really great post, sort of in defense of lorem ipsum and grayscale uh, FPO images and stuff like that. It's not, it's not that we want to take this notion of content first too far, necessarily. It's, where it's, like, it's like, oh, I'm just going to sit on my hands until you finish the copy deck and get me all the images, and then I'll start designing. It's like, no, you, we could get started so long as we know what our content structure is. So that's what this template level does, is sort of defines that skeletal system of that structure, right? What are the size of those hero images? What are the character lengths of those headlines? And so on. And then at this page level, what we're doing is we're taking that skeletal system, right, that template level, and we're pouring in real representative content into this. Right? So this is obviously a really important stage just because this is what your end users are going to be interacting with. This is what your clients and stakeholders are going to be signing off on and so on. But also, this stage is extremely important because this is where we're validating or invalidating that underlying design system. Right? What happens whenever you actually pour real content into blocks three up or into whatever patterns you've established? Do these patterns hold up? Do they work? Do they look good? Do they look good together? Do they look good in context? Yes or no? And if they don't, then you need to go back through and sort of solve some of these things you know, at a more atomic level. This pages level also gives us the ability to sort of test variations of a particular template, right? So you might have a home page template normally, but then you might have uh, a variation of that that has an alert banner on it, right, that says, closed due to impending storm coming through central Pennsylvania, right? Or di different users with different privileges or whatever, but it's still the same underlying template, but we need to be able to have an effective way of sort of testing these variations. So that's atomic design, these five distinct stages all sort of working together in tandem to create not just final work, but also establish along with it, this underlying design system. I've been working this way for about two years now. And I think that the biggest thing, the biggest advantage I see is that it gives me that ability to traverse between in context and, and out of context, right? I'm able to simultaneously see all of, 
all of my interface blown out into their atomic elements, but also simultaneously step through how all of those puzzle pieces join together to ultimately form the final experience, right? I've also found uh, in working this way with clients and stuff, they don't really give a shit about atoms and <laughs> molecules. And are, they're like, yeah, that's nice, I guess. And, you know, how much is this going to cost, whatever. Um, but at the same time, I've actually really, uh, I, I found it helpful to, to expose clients to this, right? It helps get the point across that, yeah, we're not just making you a new shiny website. We're also being really deliberate and really thoughtful with this. And we're going to deliver you more than just uh, a web design but rather this sort of underlying design system that you can live with and learn with and grow over time. I've also found, especially, it's especially relevant in the university world, um, it sort of helps prevent what I call special snowflake syndrome, right? You got a bunch of different apartments going, oh, well, I know that these are guidelines and stuff, but this site needs to be purple. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you know, by, by sort of exposing them to, to this sort of very deliberate design language and design system, it sort of helps those people better appreciate the need for consistency and cohesion across an entire organization. I've also found that atoms aren't terribly useful on their own. They're sort of a reference to keep coming back to from time to time, which is great. Um, and then pages, again, are there for, for review. They're there to sort of test that resiliency of the system. But the real actual sort of designing and building stuff happens in these in-between stages. So that's sort of the methodology, that's the philosophy behind atomic design. In order to actually make this happen, uh, I created a, a tool called Pattern Lab along with Dave Olson, who works at West Virginia University, is very much a involved with this conference and stuff, which is fantastic. And what Pattern Lab is, is it's, it's a way to sort of stitch all of these atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages together. Uh, it's a little static site generator, open source thing, so I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm not some vendor trying to prey on you. Uh, <laughs> um, with the end goal being these, you know, creating these atomic design systems to serve as those tiny bootstraps for every project, right? Provide some patterns to get started with and creates a, and includes some other features, which I could talk about. Uh, what Pattern Lab isn't, though, it's not bootstrap, right? You still have to do that work yourself, right? You still need to design and develop your own stuff. Right, Pattern Lab is just sort of there to help you stitch everything together. It's not language, library, style, or workflow dependent. So, you know, if you like jQuery, cool, go for it. If you like SAS, cool, go for it. If you don't like those tools, that's fine too. It's not incredibly rigid. If you don't like the whole atoms, molecules, organisms thing, you can sort of bulldoze all that and give them different names, and people do that all the time, and that's perfectly fine. It's also not just a pattern library, but it's also not a replacement for your CMS. It's sort of like somewhere in between, sort of bridging a gap. So here's what it looks like. Looks like shit. Uh, that's important and intentional. Um, again, we're sort of helping you know, get this point across where it's like, yeah, you're meant to do this stuff yourself, right? The, we're not here to sort of give you the answers. We're just here to give you a, a way to sort of stitch this stuff together. But what it does give is it gives you some, a way to sort of traverse all of the different patterns that make up your interface, right? So a little bit of a, a navigation stuff. So at the Atoms level, what we're doing is we're providing uh, in addition to basic sort of form tags and stuff like that, we're also providing, you know, some placeholders for color swatches, right? These really elemental aspects of our interfaces, right? We want that stuff to be consistent across the board. Our font stacks, we want that stuff to be consistent across the board, right? Even invisible things like animations, right? That stuff should be consistent even if it's this more sort of invisible thing. Right? That all sort of plays into this notion of consistency and cohesion throughout the experience. 
right? But then we also have, you know, here's our headings, here's paragraphs, here's a block quote, here's, uh, you know, inline text elements, here's a bunch of lists, here's all of our different image types, logos and hero images and square images, avatars, icons, fav icons, spinners, right? All of our different form input types, our different button types, tables, and so on. And again, like, this is just a starting point, right? You're meant to sort of rip out what you don't need and, and, and inject what you do. So then at the molecule level, what we're doing is we're creating, again, these molecules of these relatively simple components. So one project I got a chance to work on uh, last year was uh, for Time Inc., uh, the big magazine publisher company, right? And so these were some of the patterns that we established for them, right? This is this little sort of cluster that can, can, you know, is composed of uh, a heading, an excerpt, timestamp, right? All of that sort of collectively forms this little chunk, right? And we're gonna use this a bunch of different places. Here's another example, right? A little thumbnail image, headline, excerpt, pretty common pattern. We're using that a bunch of different places in the interface. The way that we're actually making this happen, the way that Pattern Lab works, is it uses this uh, templating language called Mustache. So in order to create this little guy, what we're doing, I'll show you a little code. If you're not a coder, please don't puke. I promise it's not that hard. Um, so we have a little bit of markup, and all the bits in orange are wrapped in these sort of double curly braces are our mustache code. So I, you can see I'm sort of creating a dynamic URL, I'm creating a dynamic headline, a dynamic excerpt. The real sort of magic happens with this little greater than sign, which is an include. So what we're doing is we're including another pattern, this Adam's thumb pattern, what I'm, what I'm giving a name of Adam's thumb, to pull in that 400 by 300 image, right? So what I have is, is you know, this little chunk of markup, I'm sucking in that, that image, and now I'm able to take this chunk of markup and using that same include pattern, include that in an even bigger component later on down the road. So at the organism level, again, these are relatively complex components. This was the masthead for, for Time Inc. You can sort of see pretty standard masthead, right? You have a, a logo, you have search, you have a primary navigation molecule. And whenever you crack open the hood on that thing, right, again, all it is is a little bit of header markup, and I'm including my logo, Adam. I'm including my primary navigation molecule. I'm including that search form molecule. And again, using that same pattern, I'm now able to include that in even bigger bits, right? So you can sort of see where this is going. It's like Russian nesting dolls. It's like the little bits included in the bigger bits included in the even bigger bits, right? It's sort of nice. Then at the template level, what we're doing is what the homepage template looked like for Time Inc. And you can see, again, at this template level, we're establishing that sort of skeletal system, right? Where it's the size of that big hero image, right? What's the size of that big, you know, or what's like the character count for uh, the, the, this tagline, headline, and for this other thing, and for that other hero image underneath it, right? As you sort of scroll down, you can sort of see we have a lot of this sort of placeholder stuff ready to go. And a lot of these patterns are repeated several times. And how that looks like is, again, you know, we're sort of including those, those organisms, including those relatively small components, and we're wrapping these things in, in a little bit more code just to give them a name. So we're calling the hero area hero. We're calling this experience area experience. And we'll use that at the page level to latch on to. So again, so what we're doing here is we're taking that content structure, that skeletal system, and pouring in that real representative content. So here's our homepage template right, from before. And at the page level, what we're doing is pouring in pictures of Beyonce. Um, so this is what the homepage looks like. And this is my pro tip to you. Um, if you want to fast track any design, pictures of Beyonce. Uh, higher ed, financial services, your company's intranet, doesn't matter. People are like, 
yeah, this looks great. Pictures of, pictures of Beyonce, yeah, it's great. Ship it, <laughs> get it done, right? So my, that's my pro tip to you, is like fast track designer. Pro so, okay, so yeah, so what we've done is we've taken, we've replaced that placeholder stuff with Beyonce, and we replaced the Lorem Ipsum tagline with this tagline, moving people, and we've replaced the image beneath it with this picture of the ice skater, and, and you know, the, the headline and the excerpt for that, and we've sort of pulled out and, and sort of poured in this real representative content into the designs. And the way that we're doing that is just by sort of taking that default data and actually taking a little bit of JSON and actually sort of swapping out that default stuff with the, the actual content, right? So here's where we're defining hero underscore Beyonce dot JPEG, right? Here's where the headline is, moving people, and all that stuff, right? Here's a, the experience thing where here's the, the picture of the ice skater, and then here's where we're sort of pouring that stuff in, right? So this gives us this ability to sort of create this clean separation between the structure of the site and the actual content that's going into it. And this is really, really helpful because it allows us to sort of change one of those underlying molecules or organisms while keeping that sort of content intact. It keeps things nice and dry, right? This notion of don't repeat yourself, right? So in addition to being able to stitch together these atomic design systems, Pattern Lab also provides us this, this tool to uh, create or to, to test our design systems across a bunch of different viewport sizes. So with the rise of responsive design in this whole multi-device web landscape, I see a lot of these things floating around and a lot of tutorials and code bases and stuff like that. You see. 320 pixels used in our media queries and stuff like that, right? Which is in iPhone 4 in portrait mode, right? 480 pixels in iPhone 4 in landscape mode, right? 768 pixels in iPad in portrait mode, right? 1024 pixels in iPad in landscape mode or a desktop browser, right? The fold. Oh God, the fold. <laughs> How often do we have to have those conversations, right? But this idea that, you know, we're creating these things that are meant to look good on, on, on an iPhone and an iPad in a desktop browser is just extraordinarily myopic, right? So I created a tool called Ish that we built into Pattern Lab. And the reason why it's called Ish is because you're able to click on the small button, and it gives you a smallish viewport. You click on small again, it gives you another smallish viewport. Uh, you click on the medium button, it gives you a medium-ish viewport. And the whole idea behind this is that what we're doing is we're not just creating a web experience that's meant to, to look and function great on an iPhone and an iPad, but really we're trying to create an experience that looks and functions brilliantly on any device on any screen size that happens to, to hit your web experience, right? So you could click on all these buttons and just get like a random viewport size. This is tremendously effective, not terribly effective as a design and development tool. This has everything to do with educating your clients and stakeholders and team members on, on what we're actually trying to accomplish with this whole responsive design thing. There's the, uh, the client favorite disco mode. Uh, you turn on disco mode and it just bounces your screen around like that and the client's like, oh, look at it go, look at it go, this is great. Uh, <laughs> and again, it's, it's, not, it's sort of cheeky, it's not terribly practical on its own, but it really helps get that point across where it's like, yeah, we're making you this, this website that's going to look and, and, and function great anywhere, right? Not just on to the, today's devices, but also on, on tomorrow's devices as well. Uh, Pattern Lab includes annotations, which are pretty cool, where basically uh, you switch these things on, um, and any element that has an annotation uh, gets a little number, and you could click on that and sort of read the annotation for those elements. Sort of trying to take a lot of that stuff that typically gets locked up in a PDF somewhere and actually bake that into the final actual living, breathing design system, 
right? So for time ink, we are able to sort of have annotations about our color palette, our font stacks, and we're saying blah, 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 these fonts are being served up by Typekit, and so on and so forth, right? There's also this notion of lineage. Uh, I sort of mentioned this earlier where I was a little, you know, with a lot of these pattern libraries, you don't get a sense of where these patterns are actually getting used. Uh, and that's really problematic because what if you were to make a change to that thing, right? So with Pattern Lab, uh, and this is where Dave Olson is amazing because I was like, oh, it'd be really cool if we could do that. And then like an hour later, it's like it's done. So which is amazing. <laughs> He's so good. Um, but so, so what this does, what, this notion of lineage, it basically tells you what patterns make up any given pattern and also says where this pattern gets used. Right, so in this particular example, it says, um, this blocks media link pattern contains the following patterns, Adam's square, right? This, this image, this sort of circular image, I'm just using CSS to round the corners, this little square image, right? And then it says this blocked media link pattern is included in the following patterns. It's included in the profile navigation, in this section media list organism, in the account settings, in the edit account settings. So if I were to make a change to this, let's say I doubled the size of that image, or let's say I added an extra thing to it, I would know exactly where I needed to go to re sort of QA the site to make sure that everything didn't blow up, right? This is tremendously helpful. Uh, this is another project I did for the Pittsburgh Food Bank, um, and you can sort of see, you know, it, this is their global header pattern, right, their, their header organism, and it says the header pattern contains the fo following patterns, the logo atom, the search molecule, primary navigation molecule, and that says, you know, the header pattern is included in, and it lists out all the templates because it's a, a global element, right? There's a bunch of other stuff, code view, pattern status, media query display. Uh, Dave and I are working on a new version that uh, is doing a bunch of other really fun stuff. Uh, so if you want to check it out, it's patternlab.io. Again, just an open source sort of free project. Um, and, and again, it's, it's worth pointing out that, uh, you know, I'm not here to sort of sell you on this specific tool. I think that a lot of these things that I just went over uh, are, are really helpful no matter what sort of style guide uh, you end up developing for, for you and your organization. So, so yeah, if you want to check that out, please do. Uh, and if things go wrong, uh, don't blame me. Uh, blame Dave. <laughs> that is my way of washing my hands of the matter, right? But no, Dave is, is super smart and yeah. Okay. So, how do we actually make this part of our workflow? I asked this question a while ago. So what's, what's the hardest part of this whole responsive web design thing, right? Is it the technical bits? Is it design and development? Is it responsive images? Is it media queries? Is it, you know, SaaS architecture and stuff like that? Or is it people, right? And updating your process and workflow. Just overwhelmingly, people are like, yes, it's, it's the people. Mark Bolton has this great line. He says, uh, the design process is weird and complicated because it involves people who are weird and complicated. <laughs> I just, that rings especially true for me. Uh, so I had the good fortune of working on, on a few different projects over the last uh, couple years uh, to actually, that really focused on trying to craft a better design process. Uh, one was uh, a mobile responsive site for Entertainment Weekly. Uh, another one was for a technology blog called TechCrunch. Uh, and then the, the third one was for this Time Inc. project uh, that I've mentioned already. So first things we need to do to update our process and our workflows really reset people's expectations, right? Does this look familiar to anybody, right? Let's design, <laughs> let's review the, the web design, right? Bill's gonna go to the printer, Right, print out a copy for everybody, right? We'll sort of sit awkwardly and make small talk and while Bill's away, right? Bill comes back with a copy for everybody, passes them around the table, right? You get out your red pens and start writing in, in the margins, right? So Dan Mall, who I had a chance to, to work with on, on these projects, 
Uh, he says that, you know, as an industry, we have this tendency to sell websites like paintings. Instead, we should be selling beautiful and easy access to content agnostic of device, screen size, or context. And I just think that's so beautifully worded, right? If you think about it, you know, sitting around a conference room table is about as far away from actually interacting with the web experience as you can get, right? In order to make this happen, we have to kill this notion of this sort of old, antiquated waterfall process. Worth pointing out, this dude's wearing business casual uh, as he goes down the waterfall, he's dressed up for the occasion, right? But historically, you know, maybe your design process looks something like this. It certainly did uh, for, for me, right? Or at the beginning of the process, you do, yeah, maybe you do some research or whatever, but then the, the sort of information architect or UX designer or whoever the hell you want to call yourself, you know, whatever, like they go away and they, you know, blast out this, this 200, 300 page PDF, right? We put that in front of the clients. So we say, what do you think? And they're like, Sure, yeah, like, mm, that's good, yeah, I guess, yeah, mm, proceed, right? And so then that, that UX designer hands that off to a visual designer. The visual designer takes it and colors in the lines, right? All those black rectangles and whatever, applies color and typography and texture and all that stuff and makes it look good. And then we present that comp to the client, and we're like, what do you think? And they're like, yeah. Pretty good, yeah, sure. <laughs> like, can we just change a little bit of this? And yeah, and we're like, yeah, hey, no, 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 no problem. And then we go away, and, we, and then we come back, and we're like, hey, what do you think now? And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a little closer. Yeah, we like this. Can can we just do a little bit? Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no problem. Yeah, we'll just go away, and then and then we come back, and we're like, what do you think now? And they're like, that's good. Uh, can we you know, bring back a little bit of that from V1 and whatever? And so, yeah, 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 yeah. And then this continues, right, until homepage underscore final underscore V2 underscore for review underscore final final underscore V17 underscore for Brad underscore final final dot V2 dot PSD gets approved, right? Whenever that happens, then the visual designer quietly tiptoes over to the code cave, right outside the door, slips the designs under the door, right? And as they run away, they're like, get this done in two weeks, we're already behind schedule and budget, right? <laughs> and then the coders come out and they open them, come out from the cave and <laughs> They pick up the designs and they're like, ah, it's all wrong, you're a bunch of idiots, ah. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? You're laughing because you've lived through this. <laughs> so I, I sort of suffer from this, this identity crisis, right? Where as for my entire career, I, I've sort of... <laughs> As a front-end developer, that's sort of my trade, is you know, writing HTML and CSS and JavaScript poorly, um, is, is writing this sort of front-end code. Whenever I'd be at a job, they'd say, oh, well, you know, what do you do? i said, well, I write HTML and CSS and JavaScript poorly. And, and they're like, oh, you're a coder. Go over and sit with those Ruby folks, right? Whip us up some gems. And I'm like, uh, uh, like write us some, uh, you know, write us some JavaScript middleware. And I'm like, uh, yeah, mm -mm. <laughs> my mom is an art teacher. Uh, <laughs> I've never had a computer science class in my life. This is sort of a foreign concept to me, right? And if you think about it, you know, like front end development, HTML and CSS, presentational JavaScript and stuff. I'm more akin to that person working in Photoshop or working in Sketch or, or Balsamic or whatever than I am to, you know, some back-end database normalizer person, right? So then this, this, is a, this is a hard organizational thing to overcome. Raise your hand if at your organization, designers and developers sit right next to each other. Okay, 
pretty decent amount. Raise your hand if design and development, or, or you know, you might call yourselves like marketing and IT or like some other bullshit, that, whatever, I don't know. Um, that those people are on the same floor. Raise your hand if they're on different floors, different buildings, different cities, <laughs> different countries. Right? This is, this is a huge problem that we need to overcome because in order to do good work, no one discipline has all the answers, right? Instead of working in this waterfall manner, right, we need everybody working together, right? This isn't necessarily, you know, how it goes. It's not that everybody's guns blazing all the time. It, in our experience working in this process, it's, it's looked a little something like this, right? Wherever, you know, of course at the beginning of the project, the UX designers and the people doing all this sort of high level content strategy, information architecture and so on, are gonna be burning hot and are gonna be producing a lot of stuff. But that doesn't mean that I can't get started with my job as a, as a developer and, or the visual designer can't get started with their job, right? This is fundamentally something that we need to reset our clients and our team's expectations on. So once we go sort of get that phase done, right, sort of help people understand how we're going to approach things, then we go into gather mode. In addition to doing, you know, good user research and all of that stuff, content strategy stuff and rounding up a lot of that important stuff, um, we also can gather what will become uh, the, the future style guide. Uh, this is a tool called Stylify Me, which is a really cool tool that basically lets you, you just sort of slap in your URL uh, and hit the button, and what it'll do is it'll spit back all of the unique sort of color uh, colors you're using throughout the site, uh, all the different font stacks and font sizes and stuff like that, which is fantastic. It's like, boom, there's the start to your style guide, right? Another thing that is really helpful to sort of gather things up is this notion of an interface inventory. If you're familiar with this idea of a, a content inventory, it's this big, long, tedious process where you go through your entire site and you create this giant spreadsheet and you're pasting in URLs and saying, here's who owns it, here's what template it's using, and so on. Um, really hard process, really necessary process to get a good idea of what content you have, what you're working with. Right? So an interface inventory is very similar to that, only instead of rounding up all of your unique content types, what you're doing instead is rounding up all of the, the unique interface elements that you encounter. So this is uh, my bank, some of you might know, and who, who I hate with a, with a burning passion. Uh, and you can sort of see why. This is just some of the buttons that I've encountered on their site. It's like, holy crap, guys, come on, right? But this exercise is tremendously helpful because you basically start going through and you round these things up. It gives you the ability to look at this stuff and be like, oh, the gradient's a little different, the positioning's a little different. Um, you know, all these different arrows all sort of poorly aligned. Right? But this exercise, basically what you do is you go through and you, you round this stuff up in you know, a group of people, uh, across disciplinary team, and you sort of go through and you know, assign, okay, you look for all the unique different form types that are on the site, you look for all the unique buttons, you look for all the different image types and icons and so on and so forth. Right? If you contrast my banks with an interface inventory for, this is for Etsy, who runs a really tight style guide driven shop, uh, you can see that their button styles are uh, a whole lot more <laughs> deliberate, right? More intentional, and you could just you could just tell they have their stuff together, right? But even with an organization like Etsy that has their stuff together, by doing this exercise and rounding up these sort of you know different components, right? These are all sort of instances of carousels or sliders or whatever it is you want to call them. Um, as you go down the responsive road. Right, you could sort of say, well, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to sort of combine some of these components, right? Do we really need five of these things? Maybe we could get by with three. But more importantly, like, how long are these things going to take to convert into a responsive environment? So these interface inventories, um, sort of, you go through, you highlight these in, uh, inconsistencies, you're documenting your, 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 your interface, uh, you're starting to establish that scope of work for you know, all the different components that, that compose your web experience. 
right? And this sort of gets the ball rolling and starts to help get this te your team, your organization to all start speaking the same language. You could use that and translate that into your future style guide pattern library, which is really awesome. So once we sort of get done with gathering things up, then we go into establishing our direction. <laughs> I love, love sharing this story. Uh, so uh, a friend of mine is a kindergarten teacher in Washington, D.C. And uh, one day, one of her students was like, how do you make a website? And my friend was like, well, as it turns out, we have a friend that makes websites for a living. And so they gave me a FaceTime call. This six-year-old girl, Ava, she asked, how do you make a website? I said, well, typically a good idea to you know, sort of sketch or draw a picture of what you might want that, that website to be. And about an hour later, I, I get this picture message back. And I look at it, I was like, oh, that's, that's really nice. And I looked at it again, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, this six-year-old is better than 90% of the designers I've ever worked with. <laughs> like, look at this. It's like clear titling, proper hierarchy, color coding for the X button, right? Freaking active states. She's six, <laughs> right? Here's the home page. Right? Again, proper layout, proper hierarchy, more active states. Her buttons are more consistent than my banks. Right? It's freaking incredible. Right? I love this. Well, and I, I love showing this so much just because I, I could build this right this second, right? I could, I could build this. I know exactly what she's saying. I feel like as, a, you know, as our industries mature, especially in that sort of like UX field, I feel like a lot of those 200, 300 page PDFs, those wireframes that, that, that get made, are often made just because you have a bunch of people being like, look at me, I'm useful, look at me, I'm useful, look at me, I'm useful. Like, it's not about that, right? It, uh, Jason Santa Maria has this great line. He says, that, you know, ideas are meant to be ugly. It's about getting our ideas out of our heads and onto that napkin sketch or into some working prototype or, or just whatever, right? It doesn't need to be this finely polished, you know, wireframe document heavily annotated and stuff like that, right? It's about this, this notion of being sketchy, right? Lo-fi at the beginning. And I know that this is something Samantha really advocates in her own work as well. So I had the good fortune of working with uh, Jennifer Brooke uh, doing all the UX work on the TechCrunch project. And one of the first things we showed the client were, uh, you know, her sketching tool of choice was, was Keynote. And so some of the first things that we showed the client were just an idea of, of these patterns that we are going to create for, for the client. Right, so here's a featured island. It's, a, it's just a thing we're going to you know, feature some stuff, right? like a hero area or whatever. Uh, here's a river list, like a list of uh, sort of a collection of, of news stories. Here's a river grid island, right? And we're, these are just tremendously lo-fi. You know, they don't, you know, she was able to bash this stuff out pretty quickly. And from a visual design standpoint, Right? Our, our designers were able to utilize Samantha Warren's style tiles. Right? So instead of coming out of the gate with these full-on comps, right, instead what we're doing is we're sort of putting together these, these style tiles for the client to get an idea of what they value, what they don't value. And it's like, well, here's sort of one direction. You know, here's some colors that we could use. Here's some type explorations and so on and so forth. It's not about sort of, you know, making a bunch of assumptions and coming up with a full comp, but rather furthering a conversation, getting them closer to where we need them to be. Same thing with typography. Uh, we used a tool called uh, Typecast, which allows you to stitch together different sort of type samples using different web fonts. And so for TechCrunch, we took one of their you know, sort of excerpts and just sort of put together a bunch of different type uh, uh, sort of pairings, font pairings, 
and presented these to the client. We said, you know, here's, here's sort of what we're thinking. And then we were looking for feedback like, oh yeah, you know, this feels nice and legible or this feels a little too blocky or too conservative or whatever. And again, it's, it's about just sort of making progress, establishing that design direction rather than, you know, sort of going over the top and making a bunch of assumptions right out of the gate. And from a code standpoint, I was able to get started coding the, the website from, from day one. Right? We knew we were going to have form fields. Right? We knew we were going to have a newsletter subscribe field. Right? We knew we were going to have site search. We knew we were going to be using a third party for our comments. We knew we were going to have a contact form. We knew these were publications, so there would be things like block quotes and pull quotes. We knew, unfortunately, these things were going to be ad supported. So I was able to sort of get those things out of the ad spec and drop those into Pattern Lab like from day one of the project. Right? Sort of put those things in the design system right out of the gate, right? I, I, I see this work as, as sort of like prep chef work, right? If you're familiar with this idea where, you know, in a restaurant, you know, you have these people come in the day before and they're chopping carrots and chopping onions and peppers and marinating meat and prepping the salads and stuff. So that whenever the next day, whenever the whole team gets there, they could concentrate on cooking meals together rather than having to chop a bunch of carrots, right? So once we establish that direction, establish that sort of foundation, then we sort of roll up our sleeves and we start going in and sort of getting maybe a little bit more detailed. So this was for Entertainment Weekly. And we just still pretty blocky and lo-fi, right? Same thing with, with TechCrunch, where it's like here's our, our homepage template and we're just sort of listing out essentially what's going to go on the page in what general order. That's all that needed to happen. And I was able to take that and translate that and put that into code. If you look at this, this is you know, like one of my earlier prototypes of what the home page looked like. It looks like garbage, right? And that's fine because we knew that we were going to be iterating over this stuff over time. From a visual design standpoint, uh, Dan Mall moved on to what he calls element collages, which is sort of somewhere in between a style tile and a comp, right? It's a, it's a little more concrete than a style tile, but a little less concrete than, than a full comp. And again, this is still a little bit exploratory. This is trying to get the idea across to the clients to sort of say, okay, now we're applying those, those colors, the, that typography to an actual interface. What do you think, right? Is this going in the right direction? Is this off the mark and so on and so forth? And so we take these things, include them, you know, sort of start with a, with a header organism, and we'd present this to the client, and I would sort of build it out in the browser, and we'd sort of iterate on it until we eventually came up with what became the final header, right? So then we'd end up in these sort of weird situations wherever, you know, we'd have sort of the header done, but the rest of the page still looks like trash. That's okay, right? Because we're communicating and collaborating with the client the whole time, we're going to have weekly meetings, they were able to see this progress happen over time. So this isn't that jarring of an image. If you're along for the ride, you're able to sort of see how things progress. And here, and only here, is when we actually finally started doing full design comps, right? We'd established a lot of our base patterns. We've established our sort of general direction. And the client was like, right, now can we see, you know, what the, the article template would look like? And we're like, sure. And then Dan would go into Photoshop and sort of come up with this stuff. And we'd be looking for, you know, feedback. And we, we missed the mark, and Dan had to go back and make a V2 of a PSD. But as soon as that, that feedback crossed over the line into, oh, can we you know, add a gray border around this, or can we move this over here or something? Once we got th there, then we're like, cool, we're going to do that stuff, but we're going to do that in the browser. So we're just sort of shifting you know, who's making these changes so that we're avoiding those sort of version 17 PSDs. And so that's how our process worked. This is a very lovely blend of sort of, you know, designing things, building them out in the browser, and sort of having this nice back and forth between design and development the whole time. And people are like, oh, well, you're not working in this waterfall process, so therefore it must be agile. And it's like, yeah, it's sort of, I guess. Not really, though. You know, capital A agile has its own sort of manifesto and rules and scrum masters and things like that. This is more about just sort of collaboration and communication 
right? <laughs> Collaboration with your clients, with your, with your stakeholders, with your colleagues, and communication to sort of help facilitate that collaboration. And that's gonna trump whatever it is you wanna call your process. Right? It's also going to trump whatever deliverables you produce. Sometimes, yeah, you might need to create 50 PSDs if that's what you know, the right tool is for at the right job. But having those conversations could really sort of cut down on the amount of stuff that you have to produce. I love this image. Uh, this is a, a humbling image. It sort of makes, makes you want to go wade out a little further into Pennsylvania and become a farmer, right? Where you're like, like <laughs> Like, this is our world now. It's like, nope, <laughs> off to the Amish country. Um, but this is, this is what we are up against, right? I love this quote from, from Benjamin Franklin. Right? When we're finished changing, you're finished. Right? And that's especially true in a medium that's only 25 years old, right? Whenever you find yourself in those situations where it's like, oh, this is how we've always done it, it's just like, uh, you know, <laughs> that should be a red flag. Right? And so for as challenging as this is to create for this multi-device world, uh, it's also worth pointing out, this is a hell of a lot of fun. I don't know about you, but I played with a lot of Lego as a kid, and like, I don't really see this whole atomic design stuff as, as being all that different than that. We just sort of get paid for it, which is pretty cool. <laughs> all right? So uh, if you want to learn more about this stuff, I'm writing a book on the topic. It's a little weird asking for money, but hey, it's only 10 bucks, so... To support the project. So, <laughs> everyone, thank you for your time. <laughs>